Well, if we're going to cover the world in Christ quickly, we got to get rid. We got to get rid of red tape. We got to get rid of bureaucracy. Uh, we, we have to be a little bit more nimble. We have to be a little bit more fleet-footed. And if we are a group of top executives, we get rid of a lot of that bureaucracy because these people single-handedly can start to change our corporate culture. These people single-handedly can start to bring Christ into the workplace without going up three or four layers of the chain of command, without asking for permission and everything else. Welcome to Growing Your Business with People, a podcast dedicated to business leaders aiming to foster growth within their most valuable investment, and that's people. Today, my name is Jeff Lackey, and I'm thrilled to have Paul M. Neuberger, an individual whose professional journey has encapsulated the innovation of faith, leadership, and, and how those things come together in terms of building a business. Paul is an international keynote speaker, a sales trainer, an author of The Secrets of the Cold Call Success. He's also made significant strides as CEO of C-Suite for Christ and is the host of Covering the World in Christ. His journey is as compelling a narrative of overcoming adversity, nearly facing death in pursuit of success, and emerging as a beacon of inspiration for so many. Welcome to the show. Great to be here, Brother Jeff. Thank you so much, and thank you. I'm excited to, to, I know we got a lot of things going on your plate right now. You've got a big, big event coming up in March 6th, uh, you know, for C-Suite for Christ and covering the world for Christ. Um, you want to, you know, I want to let folks know a little bit about that to just get things started. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about Yeah, uh, so the, the number one thing on about that. our ministry that, that I want individuals to know, especially in the business space, is primarily speaking, we are not a networking group. Primarily speaking, we're not a professional development organization, although those things certainly do happen. I don't think this world needs more networking. I don't think this world needs more professional development. I think what this world needs is more Christ. So we are an organization that uh, boldly and unapologetically stands on the Great Commission. We think the Great Commission is just as important today, if not more so, than it was when Jesus first made that statement. So what we try to do with these events, uh, the first that you mentioned is our Covering the World in Christ conference. That's coming up on March 6th. That's really a day of three things. Prayer. Uh, we have a, a powerful prayer breakfast, and we've got some other opportunities to lift up our intentions to, the, to our Heavenly Father fellowship, which is always important. But it's also a day of professional development. We're bringing in some really powerful Christian leaders from all over the world to, to speak and teach us how to integrate our faith into our professional lives. Uh, so that'll certainly be worthwhile. And then the following day, which is Thursday, March 7th, that's going to be the Covering the World in Christ celebration. Uh, we're expecting about a crowd of nearly 2,000 people. Uh, Tim Tebow is going to be our keynote speaker. Matt Marr is going to be our musical performer. It's a night of praise, a night of worship, really a night to, to bring the body of Christ together. But the, the, the real primary goal is that everybody leaves going, okay, I am done being quiet about my faith. I am done hi hiding this under a bushel basket. I'm going to tell everybody and anybody about my Heavenly Father. So uh, it's going to be a powerful two days, and we'd love as many people as possible to join us. See, well, that's pretty powerful. And uh, and a, a disclosure, I am a member of the Speakers uh, Bureau for C Suite for Christ, and I'll be at the convention coming up, and uh, and cannot wait to hear those speakers, as well as uh, as well as be able to share my faith uh, with others uh, of like mindedness. So really can't wait. One of the things that I notice uh, in business is, and I feel is very important, is that you know Jesus gave us two commandments right off the bat. First is love, love God, love your father, right? And then the second is love your neighbor, right? And I feel as though business is really, if you if you your foundation is around that second commandment, uh, you really can't go wrong. And you might not be a trillionaire or a billionaire, but that wasn't God's intention for you anyhow. If you're following the second commandment. He's showing you what you what he wants from you, and he'll give you the things that you need, and it might even give you more than you ever expected. So, I uh, I feel very very passionate about that, and and the Great Commission is uh, obviously one of the 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 things that he emphasized. Uh, you know, between love one another and uh, and 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 showing sharing God's love with uh, with other people. So I can't wait. Thank you so much for doing that. So as a preface to our conversation, a lot of folks, you know, you may be listening to this and, uh, and you may be like saying, okay, so what, what is this intersection of, uh, of, of faith and business? What is this all about? You know, 
well, we're going to talk about the significant role that faith can actually play in the workplace. Recent studies have and data have suggested that incorporating faith in the workplace can lead to one higher levels of employee satisfaction and engagement, increased resilience, a stronger sense of community, and more ethical behavior. If you don't want those in your organization, then you probably have no business being in business, right? Uh, but uh, organizations that embrace faith and are often seen as more compassionate, more supportive, and they enhance employee morale and productivity. The foundation of faith not only nurtures a positive corporate culture, but it also fosters personal growth among the employees, contributing to the overall success of the business. So today, we want to talk to Paul about a few things. But before we get started, Paul, could you really give us a sense of yourself and, uh, and, and your background and start by giving us a brief over, overview of your remarkable journey, your remarkable journey, uh, including what are the two or three most pivotal events in your life that have shaped really who you are? Yeah, I would say there's two events that are probably sticking out the most. Uh, there's more, but but I think though the ones that really have have made me who I am today. I think the first one would uh, would have to be my junior year of of college. So I graduated college in 2005. So this will be right around 2003, probably right after Christmas of 2000. So like January, February of 2003. And, um, one of the things that makes me, me, I know I'm not alone in, uh, describing myself this way, but I've always been, a an alpha male. I've always been a hard, uh, somebody who's very hard on myself. I've been a, uh, an achiever, a perfectionist, basically, uh, it's always kind of started when I was younger. I, I just felt the need to get really good grades. If I was going to play baseball, I had to hit six grand slams a game. If I was going to date somebody, I had to date the prettiest girl. It's, it, it's just a lot of it was a, was a device of, of my own making, but if I was going to be good, I wanted to be the best. And finally my junior year of college, that's when it, kind of all came crashing down because it, it, it's just, it's unrealistic expectations. It's an incredible amount of pressure, which leads to an incredible amount of stress. When you don't rise to the level that you feel for yourself, you feel bad about yourself, which leads to depression. And basically I, I was just carrying all this stress around and, um, and I cracked. And then what that did is, is that really kind of manifested in sleep deprivation. I probably went about three months without really sleeping at all. And I, I don't remember saying this, but since my mom tells me, uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's true, but my parents could tell something was wrong. My parents could tell I wasn't myself. My parents could tell I was in a, a pretty bad place. And in one of the phone calls I had with my mom, I ended the phone call by saying, but don't worry, it's not like I'm going to kill myself or anything. Again, I don't remember saying that, but thankfully my mom heard that. Thankfully, she was very attentive. Uh, she came up to the dorm where I was residing. About 48 hours later, uh, she was able to convince the dean of students to give me like a three-week hiatus, and I uh, recouped at home. But but basically, did this unrelenting pressure of stress, of anxiety, of depression, of worry, of everything's got to be perfect, led me to that point. And it was a it was a dark place to be. Uh, I hated myself so much. I wanted to take my own life. I didn't want to get out of bed in the morning. I thought I had no redeeming qualities. I figured I was failing everybody, including myself. I mean, I, I was just in a very, very, very dark place. And I, I went through intensive psychotherapy and my psychotherapist was the guy that really kind of brought this to my attention. He's looking at my life on paper, Paul, I, this isn't making a whole lot of sense. I mean, you're basically a 4.0 pre-med student. You're involved in everything. Um, you know, you're a popular guy. You've got a lot of good things going for you what's missing. And after some introspection and discussion, we realized that my faith was missing. Uh, I grew up in a faith filled home. We went to church every single weekend. We said our prayers. And it's one of those things I just drifted in college. You know, when you're at parties and staying up late and doing whatever on Saturday night, you're not really eager to go to church at eight o'clock the next morning. So I really wasn't going to church. I wasn't spending time in the word. My relationship with Jesus was starting to fray. And accordingly, my life was off kilter, which led to some of these issues. So that was the first wake up call that I had that um, Jesus not only needs to be a part of my life, Jesus needs to be the central focus of my life. And it wasn't like the next day I went to church and I was fine. It was about a 15 year recovery, some some setbacks, some progress, uh, some uh, progression. And eventually I got to a point where I was in a pretty good spot. I got into a, a place that was such a good spot 
that I lost discipline. And what I mean by losing discipline, I, I kept the faith part of it, but I, I just, I threw myself into work. I became a bona fide workaholic. Things were going so well. I just kept immersing myself into it. I, re, I reversed to my perfectionist ways. Everything had to be absolutely perfect. Uh, by this time I had a wife, I had three small kids. Uh, my marriage was fraying because I wasn't spending much time with my wife. I was becoming an absentee father because I wasn't taking advantage of the things that my kids wanted me to do with them. And about three years ago, I had a relapse. Uh, had to pull myself. I had, I, had to, I had to basically cancel all my appointments, unplugged for almost two months. Uh, and I was diagnosed with pretty severe obsessive compulsive disorder. It was really taking over my life. And again, I think that was God's way of saying, whoa, you're, you're off kilter here again. And after several months, uh, again, of medication, of therapy, of, of really just getting rid of all these distractions, I now find myself in a place where I am busier than I've ever been, but where I'm happier than I've ever been, where I'm at more peace than I've ever been. I'm getting more sleep than I've ever gotten. I'm as healthy as I've ever been, all because I boldly and unapologetically keep Christ at the center of my life. So uh, for good or bad, but the, the two real momentous moments in my life were two instances of mental health crises. I don't wish those upon anybody. They were terrible to go through, but honestly, I'd go through them again 10 times over each if it led me right back to this place again. Those are powerful. And quite frankly, you're, you're talking about situations that so many people experience in one way, shape, or form, where they have that moment where they realize that, the, that all the effort and all their personal discipline and all the things that they do will never be enough. Right? And they've come, I think I've heard it referred to as coming to the end of yourself. And then you really understand where, where, where Christ takes over, you know, he, he takes over, uh, he doesn't take over just at the end of yourself. He takes over at the beginning of yourself. It's the question of whether we let him, let him take, you know, take control and, and direct our lives or not, or if we want to keep on controlling our lives. And that's, uh, that's very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I hope that resonates with folks because that's, uh, that's, that's something that many people deal with. I know a number of individuals who, who struggle with, you know, my father uh, struggled with bipolar disorder, mood disorder. And the fact is, is that it's, it can be debilitating. He was similar to you, Paul. He was a perfectionist in all his ways. Never could let anything, you know, out of his sights. Never, never let anybody down. Uh, you know, was, was, had integrity as long as the day was, but put everything on his own shoulders and never would want to give that stuff up to, to God and say, you know, God, this is, some of this is, you've got to take this off. Well, one of the things that I would say, it, you know, it, it, it sucks to go through, but one of the things that I would say to anybody who finds themselves in a season like that, God is not doing this to you as like a punishment or his wrath. Instead, God is doing this for you. And what I've come to understand is so many people crowd Jesus out of their lives. They're, they're just too busy. They're, they're too busy to go to church. They're too busy to pray. They're too busy to spend time in the Word. They're too busy to go to a Bible study. But the reason why God put me through all that is because he loves me unconditionally. Now, a lot of people are going to think, what? You know, he loves you so much that he takes you to the brink of suicide. Well, he loves me so much because he's desperately trying to get my attention. And I, I wasn't making time for him. So what he had to do is he had to force into the equation. And when, when you look back at that first crisis that I had when I was in college, that manifested, like I said, that manifested itself in sleeplessness. Well, if you look back on it, it makes a lot of sense because the only time I had quiet in my life was when I was sleeping. The only time I, I was a human being as opposed to a human doing was when I was sleeping. So God needed that time. That was the only time I gave him to get my attention. So... For me, it worked, and it forced me to kind of change my ways. When it went to this obsessive-compulsive disorder, again, people use the word obsessed, like I'm obsessed with the Packers or I'm obsessed with pizza. People don't know what obsessed is unless you have clinical OCD, where it's literally a thought that just takes over everything. You can't function. You, you, you can't even worry about the task at hand because this thought is so overriding. And they're, they're never happy thoughts, like you're thinking about kittens and rainbows. No, you're, you're thinking about terrible things. And... um. I don't share this with a lot of people, Jeff. I mean, I do tell them I had OCD, but but the, the thing that I was, and this is going to sound stupid, but all OCD really kind of is, I was obsessing about the sound of my voice. 
I, I've got a radio voice. I, I, I speak for a living. And if I don't have a good voice, it's going to be hard for me to make money. And it was like a day where I was talking a lot. My voice was strained at the end of the day. And my wife said, is your voice okay? That triggered something in me where then I was constantly worried about my voice. Every time I talked, I was obsessing about the sound of my voice. And it, it filled me with a lot of worry. When you look back on it retrospectively, I just thought it was interesting that the the two things that were most important to me, rest and my voice, those are the things that God used to get my attention because nothing else was working. I was ignoring the, the warning signs. I was ignoring the red flags. I knew I should have been behaving better, but I wouldn't. It's almost like God saying, Paul, I'm sorry, but I love you so much. I got to bring you down to your knees so the only place you can look is up. So my, my word of encouragement is if somebody's going through that, it's likely God is just trying to get your attention. The sooner you turn your attention to him, I like to imagine the sooner that season is going to pass. This podcast is brought to you by Paradox AI, also known as Olivia, recruiting's most advanced AI assistant. I used Paradox at my previous organization, and their team helped us create a candidate concierge experience that ensured a fast hiring process that still felt very human. We literally hired hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom were critical healthcare workers needed during the pandemic. It's not just me. Organizations like McDonald's, General Motors, Unilever, and L'Oreal use this technology to create engaging and fast candidate experiences. Go to Paradox.ai to learn more about the amazing things Paradox and Olivia can do for you. Yeah, well, I, I know a, a lot of folks lean on Romans eight twenty eight. You know, for all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are the called according to His purpose. And I know, uh, you know, that's what you're describing right there. It's to say, and you know, God's working these things out for you know for your good and for His purpose. You know, and and those things are combined, and when they're aligned, then they're perfect. You know, and that's that's so encouraging. Thank you for sharing that. Well, talking about aligning with purpose, right? We we talk about the fact that you've you're now CEO and uh, you've started the C suite for Christ, which is amazing, and uh, and I think you gave a nice description of it. Uh, you know, is not being a development program, not being networking, but really allowing folks to be able to to uh, you know to promote the group, the Great Commission. That's that's simple, but also covering the world in Christ. Uh, so curious as a leader of those there's a you know we're not in heaven yet we haven't inherited heaven and everything isn't perfect right so that you have both the very encouraging times as well as challenging aspects of creating and leading these initiatives could you share with the, the audience a little bit more about you know kind of what you've been through to be able to help create uh, yeah sure and, and for me I, I just made the decision about five and a half six years ago i can get more into that story in a minute but where, where individuals get into trouble is when they try to serve too many masters. And it's very easy to do that when you look at it. So I'm a happily married husband. I've got three small children. I own multiple businesses and the list goes on and on and on. So somebody like me, I would say I've got many masters. One, I've got my stakeholders professionally. Two, I've got my clients. Three, I got my wife. Four, I got my kids. Five, I got you know, God, six, I got uh, the bills that need to be paid, the creditors, whatever the case is. That's a lot of masters. And when you're trying to please all these different masters, it, it can lead to some friction. It can lead to some anxiety. It can lead to some stress. What your boss requires is different than what your wife requires. What your wife requires is different from what your board requires. It, it's just a very tough balancing act where it just seems like you're pulled in all these different directions. That does lead to stress. That does lead to burnout. That also leads to some poor decisions. So I'm not to say that you don't treat all those people with import, because you certainly should, but you ultimately have to make the decision. Who are you at the end of the day totally and utterly accountable for? And for me, that answer was fairly simple. It's God. It's God first, and then everybody else is a distant second, including my wife, including my kids. That doesn't mean I'm a negligent husband. That doesn't mean I'm a bad father, but it's my God's will first. So, you know, where, where people will say, you know, I want to bring Christ into the work in the work in the workplace, but I don't want to offend anybody. My my question is always the same. W or my response is always the same. WDSS. What does scripture say? And whatever scripture says, 
That's what you do. It's that simple. There is nothing in Scripture that says cover the world in Christ, but only if it's culturally appropriate. There's nothing in Scripture that says tell the world about me unless it offends somebody, then stop. That's not what it says. WDSS, what does Scripture say? So Scripture lays it all out. Scripture says, to, to your point, we need to love our God more than anything else, more than money, more than success, more than looks, more than power. We need to love people, including people that are really, really difficult to love. I've got some people in my life that are extremely difficult to love. I'm not going to name names because I don't want I don't want to go down that road. But um, we're supposed to love them anyway, including the people that attack me on LinkedIn. This is one of the things that happens when you have a hundred and whatever we have, almost 200,000 followers. There's a lot of people that don't like what we do. I still got to love them. I still got to love on them. And then also the Great Commission, cover the world in Christ. That, that, that's a difficult one. And we face that backlash every day. This is a world that hates us. This is a world that despises us. This is a world that is trying to wipe us off the face of the earth because Christ convicts, because Christ forces people to take a cold, hard look in the mirror. Yet we can't stop. We got to keep going. So at the end of the day, it, it really came into focus and it really solidified itself because I, I made the conscious decision. If I'm doing what God wants, I'm putting my trust in God. And if I'm putting my trust in God, I have faith that he's going to hold up his end of the bargain. Have I lost clients? Of course. Have I offended people? Daily. But you know what? God has provided for me and my family. God has opened up opportunities and doors for me and my family. And God has me on a trajectory right now that is outside anything that I ever could have dared dreamed. So if you surrender everything to Christ, if you put your faith in him, just watch how he goes to work on your behalf. It's something really to to behold. You know, it's interesting. We just, uh, last night we had, uh, we were talking at church and one of the things we talked about was the concept of love and saying, you know, God doesn't, agape love uh, can actually be hypocritical. Like uh, they talked about the Pharisees and the uh, actually loving their positional power. They had agape love for their positional power, right? And that's, that's misappropriating or hypocritically placing love in the wrong order. You know, you got to put it in the correct order. And to your point, God is first. He talks about, you know, your family and your, uh, and loving one, you know, uh, your brothers, other brothers and sisters in Christ talks about loving your neighbor, you know, uh, but it put it, he clearly puts God first and then puts all those people, uh, including to your point, I love what you said. They're loving your enemies, people that would, would choose to hate you because we're loving them because God loved us while we were still enemies of him. And we're choosing to love our, our enemies, people who hate us before they have a chance to to even return that love to us because that's a that's our demonstration of what Christ. Well, I, and I yeah, and I would agree with that. And again, I, I just I just keep it extremely simple. Again, WDSS. What does Scripture say? It's not mm-hmm. complicated. The answers are all right there. And it, I'm paraphrasing, but it does say in Scripture, if your right arm uh, forces you to sin, cut it off because it's it's you'd rather be in heaven without an arm than in hell with both arms. And it's it's the same. With respect to our life, if money is forcing you to stray from God, either get rid of it or, or, or change your behavior. If your wife is keeping you from God. Now, I'm not a huge advocate of divorce, especially when you take those marital vows. But again, as it says in Scripture, you know, you, you do everything you can to try to reconcile. You, you bring your grievances to each other. And if that doesn't happen, then you got to seek re, uh, remediation. But if your spouse is keeping you from heaven, if your kids are keeping you from heaven, if your job is keeping you from heaven, and that's a, the last thing I'll say, Jeff. There's, there's one of the things that, that I really don't understand either, where people will say, you know, I, I can't be my Christian self at my job. My response is always the same. Then why do you stay there? Hmm. And, and after some pausing, the people right. say, well, what if I can't find another job? Well, well, then it's almost like, well, where's your faith? You know, God tells you to act a certain way. God tells you to be a certain way. God tells you to conduct yourself a certain way. This organization is preventing you from being the person that God wants you to be, as it says in scripture, you got to cut that arm off. You, you, you got to, you got to cut your ties with this organization. If it's actually bringing that to that point, God will help you find another job. God will open up some opportunities. It might take a little bit, but at the end of the day, you got to do what God wants you to do. He's your master, not anything in secular society. Yeah. And, and to your point, I think trials and tribulations increase our faith. They're there to increase our faith. And, and that's why people always, 
you know, the joke is be careful not to ask for an increase in faith, you know, uh, or, or, or patience because your, those trials will increase, you know, will, will try your faith and then it will uh, result ultimately in patience. And I, and I say, you know, to those people, I say, you know, don't, don't joke about that because quite frankly, we need more patience and we need more faith and we need to be acting in ways that are more bold uh, for him. So that's, uh, that's, that's very inspiring. So let's talk a little bit about, um, uh, the fact that, you know, you've, you've, you've obviously, you've started these organizations, you're, you're serving as a leader of these organizations. And now we're really getting on the cusp of, cusp of what do you, what's next? You know, where are you taking, what are some of the exciting partnerships and future endeavors that you get that obviously God is leading, uh, but that you're, uh, that you're, his hands and feet to be able to do. Yeah. So, you know, what the, the thing that needs to be a hallmark of C-Suite for Christ is we have to be true to our mission. We have to be true to ourselves. And I'm not saying we get criticized a lot. I'm not. But of the, of the pushback and the criticisms we get, one of the ones that appear on that list from time to time is individuals that are not top executives, individuals that are not C-Suite, individuals that are not in a position of executive decision-making authority and they kind of get a little agitated when we tell them they can't be a member of our group. Why? You guys think you're better than us? Why? You guys more important? And the answer is 100% not even close. I mean, in my case, I think I'm worse than most people. So no, that, that is not at all the reason. The reason why we're a group of top Christian executives is because not only do we need to cover the world in Christ, we got to do so quickly. I mean, the rapid rate of deterioration in this society is just enough to give you whiplash. Just the things that we're dealing with today compared to where we were three or four years ago, it's mind boggling. Well, if we're going to cover the world in Christ quickly, we got to get, re- we got to get rid of red tape. We got to get rid of bureaucracy. Uh, we, we have to be a little bit more nimble. We have to be a little bit more fleet footed. And if we are a group of top executives, we get rid of a lot of that bureaucracy because these people single-handedly can start to change our corporate culture. These people single-handedly can start to bring Christ into the workplace without going up three or four layers of the chain of command without asking for permission and everything else. So, Accordingly, we're a group of Christian executives. We've got nearly 3,000 people associated with the ministry. However, it is not lost on us that we have not been able to reach everybody that we otherwise could. So without sacrificing our mission, in the very near future, you're going to see two pretty exciting endeavors that, that I think have already got a lot of traction. We've already got a lot of individuals and organizations that are ready to line up behind us on this. The first one is what we're going to call future C-Sweeters for Christ. It's going to be a ministry within the C-Suite for Christ umbrella. We are still an organization that caters to business executives, but the way that we see this is for non-executives. So you got to be at least 18 to be in future C-Sweeters for Christ. So we're going to be targeting college students and non-executive employees, Mm -hmm. just like C-Suite. We're going to give them a place to go once a month, a place for worship, a place for fellowship, a place for inspiration, encouragement, a place to go for small groups. How is your soul? That kind of a thing. But what we're really looking to do now, I'm being a little generalistic here, but the majority of the people that are going to be in future C-suiters are typically going to skew younger. Not everybody, but that's just the way that it's, it's going to be from a demographic perspective. We look at this as an opportunity to get to them before the world does, because the world feeds you a load of crap by saying you can't talk about Christ at the office. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not true. We want to get to them before the world does. We want to tell them it's okay. We want to show them it's okay. We want to align them with other Christian executives who are leading the way in this regard. So that'll be coming up here pretty soon. The other thing that'll be coming up, and again, right or wrong, there's only so many hours in the day, but we have not developed a lot of really good relationships with churches. That's not to say we have bad relationships, but we we just have never really made congregations much of a priority. That's going to be changing too, because as we talk to these senior pastors, as we talk to these congregations, the churches all have very similar problems. Our attendance isn't as good as we want. Maybe our our financial assistance isn't as good as we want. You know, we've got some pretty key stakeholders within the congregation. We just don't see them very much. We can't engage some of these people. So what we're going to be launching is um, another ministry. It's called Congregations for Christ, where what we do is we offer a lot of value to churches uh, to reach the business executives within their church. They get an annual membership discount. We give them Bible study materials. We, we bring in a lot of partners 
um, like right now, media, some other organizations that can serve their members. We give them a place to go uh, where they can network and enjoy some fellowship with other executives. But it's our prayer that if these churches now offer resources for top executives, those top executives are more likely to go to church. Those top executives are more likely to be engaged. Those top executives are more likely to start giving to the church. And those top executives can be the people that God wants them to be. So th those are the two big initiatives. In addition to growing the membership, in addition to planting chapters all over the world, uh, we'll be making some formal announcements soon. Mm -hmm. Congregations for Christ uh, to, to really bring value to these churches. And then also future C-Sweeters for Christ to groom our future leaders to live boldly and unapologetically for him. What tremendous resources those are. C-Suite for Christ, you know, the uh, future C-Suite for Christ, congregations for Christ. Because I know that, you know, there's a lot of business leaders out there that want to have an impact. But sometimes they're like, okay, well, I could start something from scratch, but the effort that it takes and will I actually get the traction that I need because I don't necessarily have the resources or the experience to do it in that particular venue, right? I could do it in the business world, say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a supply chain executive or I'm, a, or I'm a CEO of this type of uh, building material or what have you. But, but I don't know anything about starting a ministry. And all of a sudden that, that, that fear and intrepidation like holds them back. What I see you guys is doing is enabling and saying, no, you don't have to be the expert. We'll come alongside you and help you to be able to get the word out. And, and ultimately, like you said, the Great Commission is the, uh, is the, the end game here. It's building up his kingdom uh, to be able to serve, uh, you know, to serve and be able to see uh, as many people as we possibly can on the other side of the river of life. So that's tremendous. Right. Thank you for that, Paul. That's exciting stuff. Thank you for that. So we're going to finish up this uh, wonderful interview. This has been tremendous. But uh, as we always do, with one or two pieces of advice that, uh, that Paul, you'd like to be able to offer other CEOs or business leaders who are looking to grow their business by investing in people, especially in considering the intersection of faith and, uh, and leadership. Yeah, so uh, this would, and these are both faith-based. That's just the way that I, I look at life. The, the, this first one is going to sound really morose, but I, I think it's the key to a good life. Think about your death every day. Mm -hmm. We're not going to live forever. Mm -hmm. there, there is, all of us have this clock, and that clock is ticking. Jeff, I've got 40 fewer minutes left in my life than I did before we started this conversation today. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm spending it with you because spending it with my brother in Christ is a good investment of those minutes, but it's really true. So one of the things that I think about, and, 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 that, and that, you know, people will ask, you know, I, I do put in a lot of hours for sure. I, I do a lot of stuff. I take calculated risks, but I take big risks. I do. Geez, Paul, how do you do this? And the answer is always the same. You know, I guess I'm thinking about my death every day. Uh, this could be the last conversation that I ever have. Did, did I leave it all out on the field? Did I use my God-given talents? Did I live my life to proudly proclaim who I am or proudly proclaim whose I am? And I think it's really important. Everybody's got to remember there is going to come that time where you're going to have that final exit interview in the sky. You're going to be standing face to face with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At that point, there aren't no do overs. At that point, you can't go back. You can't hit the reset button. What did you do with the talents and abilities that I gave you? Did you honor my commandments? Did you tell the world about me? Did you love your neighbor? Did you love other people? Did, was I your God or was money your God or fame your God? And here's the thing Can you imagine looking Jesus face to face and he says, Hey, how many people did you tell about me? And you say, Well, I wanted to. But I didn't want to end up in Facebook jail. Gosh, I don't think that answer is going to find a real receptive audience. So number one is just remember, you are going to die someday. It might be sooner than you think. And when that happens, you're facing your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, basically face to face. What are you going to be able to say? What are you going to be able to share? And if you don't like your answer right now, then, you know, again, seize the day. The, the other thing that I would say in terms of what I would say in terms of what, what is a, a real good idea for a practice or what you do moving forward, you know, I don't want to say trust your gut because that, that, that's, there, there, there's so much more than just trusting your gut. But 
at the end of the day, this kind of goes back to having that one life to live. You know, there, there's just so many people that I know that are unhappy. There's so many people that I know that have so many regrets. I'm in a marriage that is killing me. Well, get out of it. I'm in a job that I hate. Well, get out of it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 pounds overweight. Well, do something about it. You know, it, it's, 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 it's just one of those things that we all need hope in life. That to live a life that is devoid of hope, that is hopeless, I can't imagine anything as bad as that. You are empowered to live the life you want. If you want happiness, go get it. If you want joy, go get it. If you want a satisfying job, go get it. If you want someone that will love you for who you are, go get it. If you want to like the sight of you with your in a bathing suit, go do it. I mean, everybody will find a reason to procrastinate and stall and not do it. But the life you want is only one decision away. So remember, someday you are going to face your heavenly father. What, what kind of answers are you going to have to the questions? And you only have one life. So to be anything other than insanely happy and content makes no sense to me. So do what it takes as long as it's ethical, as long as it's moral, as long as it's in align with God's teachings. And live a high-quality life. That's what he wants you to do. Yeah. Well, and we know the source of peace and joy is actually God himself, right? So that alignment with his purpose, seeking his spirit, is seeking his desires in your life, and then being able to align your desires with his desires, that's exactly where you're going to get those things. You know, you're, The more money you have will not define how happy you are. But if God decides to give you the money that you need to be able to serve his kingdom, that's going to be a that's going to be a happy day when you can turn around and be able to use that use that money to be able to do the things that he's expected you to do with it, being a good and faithful servant. And then when you get up to heaven and you, and, and you hear those words, good and faithful servant, I mean, you're probably going to be face down in shame already, you know, saying, you know, I'm not worthy as as all of the anybody who who's come face to face or anywhere near god has has been but he's going to lift you up and say no you've been a good and faithful servant those words will be you know those words will be eternal at that point so what an exciting time thank you lord uh, for giving us this uh time together thank you paul for spending the the time with me i guess the one thing i, I want to sh- think about is think about your death but also the other thing i tell folks is that you know just be, we don't have an eternity here on earth and neither do our family and friends so if we're going to share make sure that we're we're sharing with intent and with intention i still remember there's a, a gentleman the first person outside of my family that who i'd ever let, uh, led to christ it was in a fairgrounds of all place and i was working this booth for our church and and the guy would looked up at the sign and it said, are you 50, 75 or 100 percent sure that when you die, you're going to heaven? And the guy looked at it and he just stepped, sat there folding his arms. And he pointed at the sign. And he goes, I'm not sure. And um, and I'm like, you're not sure if you're going to heaven. And he goes, yeah, I'm not sure. So I talked with him. And I started sharing with them, you know, the Romans road and the, and the gospel. And we were standing right in the middle of the, of the place where all the people were coming in. And so I, he's like, yeah, I'd like to learn more about this. So I said, well, why don't we just step aside? So we're not actually blocking traffic. Literally hundreds of people are having to go around us like parting of the seas type of thing. So we move off as I turn to walk away with them, a, a, a gentle hand, touches me right on the on the inside of my bicep and then pulls me in a little bit and this lady comes in close right by my ear and she goes i've been praying for this moment for 30 years it was his wife so she is a believer and she'd been praying for 30 years for her husband to know christ as a savior that's the type of impact that you may or may not be able to lead your children to the Lord. You may or may not be able to lead your family members to the Lord. You hope that you can, but, uh, but maybe you might be the person who inspires the person who was actually put in the path, you know, in that fairground someplace. 
that ends up uh, being the one that uh, shares the gospel and uh, and allows the, them to be able to to know where the eternity is is being held. So, thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate your time. It was an honor to be today. here, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you for sharing your immensely insightful experiences with us. Your journey and the work that you're doing with Sea Suite for Christ is just inspiring. To our listeners, we hope this conversation has been uh, has been so valuable, and uh, and the perspectives on integrating faith in the workplace are hopefully just profound, because it's going to have an impact on not only your business but also your personal growth. So don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, subscribe on YouTube, listen to our podcast on any of our seventeen audio channels. Your likes, your shares, subscriptions are all greatly appreciated, but most of all, your comments, they're needed because I take all that input and we use it to make this show better every time. So thanks again, Paul. Appreciate hey, your time today. Absolutely, brother.